let me say this. The status quo was being or is being protected for a reason because what's going to happen on the other side of it is uncertainty. And some people don't like that. Uh, people have been doing it one way. It's been the same way for, for a while now. There hasn't been much of a shakeup. So if it goes in the way that I think it's going to go with the decentralization, who knows what this is going to look like. And there's going to be some people that may fall in and out. And I welcome that. Even if it was me, even if it's me that, that somehow doesn't make it on the other side, I'm I'm okay with that because I think ultimately the customers benefit the most. Hello and welcome, friends, to CultureScape, the podcast that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built our modern nerd culture. Today, I'm excited to bring with you this interview with the wonderful Eric D. July, a.k.a. Young Rippa, a talented musician, a prolific comics creator, and pop culture YouTuber, a fellow libertarian, and now a successful independent comics man with his own company producing the wonderful first issue of ISOM just recently for his new company, The Rippaverse. In this interview, we will discuss July's journey into his love of comics and nerdery, how he got into YouTube, the ISOM campaign, some of the censorship issues he's seen from places like PayPal, and where he hopes to take the Ripaverse from here. Thank you, Eric, for coming on the program. Hey, brother, I appreciate you having me. This should be fun. All right. Well, let's tell the folks a little bit about your background. Of course, many people probably are familiar with your YouTube channel. How did you get started being interested in uh, comics and geekery? Well, that was something that was kind of, uh, kind of, I don't want to say born into it, but it was one of those things where I got introduced to comics and I was a very, I was young, you know, and it just so happened to be during that time where media or comic book media outside of obviously the comic books was really at its apex. And that was in the nineties where you had X-Men, the animated series, Batman, the animated series, a little bit of Spider-Man. And some of those things that really aged very well happened to be coming out during the time where I was a youngster, right? Fox kids and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of got me into the world of that. But my first kind of introduction to like a comic per se was uh, Flash. And it was just obviously a character. And that was, you know, during my coming up was, you know, Wally was the Flash. And seeing that there was a character that was, you know, thing was to run fast. And that was what I did. I mean, I did that all the way through the collegiate level and being a track and field athlete. So the fact that there was a um, a character who used that ability, although more extreme kind of thing, considering how fast Flash is and doing good, I thought was a very intriguing thing as a youngster. And that was kind of my bridge into that that kind of world. And as I got older, you know, you get a, you get your job and yeah you're able to actually pay for this stuff you know not mm -hmm. having to rely on grandma to get me a, a get me a comic or one to buy some or begging some begging her or my mother or whoever to buy something now nah, i could afford it myself uh and that's when i really really go into my teens and uh really really was able to you know dive into that that sort of stuff so i was introduced in it at a at a right time for me at least to be a comic book uh a person that was just say into that material yeah no and i i was i'm a big fan too of especially with wally west his comics in the 90s and 2000s were just they were they were just really on point there's some right. strong material there um so how did how did you decide that you wanted well first off before you even did the the comics thing you are a musician correct yes well, what's the name of your band backwards b-a-c-k-w-o-r-d-z and uh that band <clears throat> Oh uh, man, so much just happened with that. And it changed like so much of my, my direction in terms of even how I am doing stuff with the comic kind of came full circle because of backwards. But to your point, uh been a musician pretty much my entire life, growing up in the church, choir, all of that stuff, and obviously producing it in the in teenage years. Uh, but obviously hit big with first band being in Fire from the Gods, which is a band, of course, is still going on and still kicking. Uh, right now, and then after I left that, formed backwards, and you know we took off. I had a you know hit first album, 
Uh, and, you know, that kind of was a test run. I was what? I started back as 25. So that was a test run to me saying, okay, I see in entertainment a problem. I don't like it. And I want to do something about it. So it wasn't just about the material, right? It was just, it wasn't about, okay, there's, uh, I'm an artist. I want to make music, have fun, yada, yada, yada. You want to do all that. But for backwards, it was bigger than that because it was like, okay, I don't like how deals are structured. I don't like how people feel like this whole starving art artist idea where you have people jumping into, uh, on, ro on the road and touring for next to nothing just for the sake of doing it. None of that made sense to me. So for backwards, it was kind of a thing where we were like, you know, we're just not going to do what everybody else says that we have to do in order to exist and be uh, successful in this industry. Uh, and that's what it was. And it's funny watching this full circle because, or watching it come full circle, because with the launch of the Riververse, it was the, the, some of the similar things that I heard back then where you shouldn't do this because it's not the industry standard. And you get folks that are even part of the industry that shun upon the fact that, well, you're doing it a different way. And, and in a lot of cases, they will try to steer you away from doing it. Not every time is it like, let's say, malintent or just like, wanting you to do bad that's not yeah. generally what it is some of it is just they don't know any better either so uh, they think what you genuinely are doing is a bad idea so it's the same thing that happened with with uh with uh with the river versus deal with backwards and it was so much that i learned from that experience of going against the grain and being a part of an industry and seeing success and getting the pushback it is that we got because a lot of it was because, yeah, I'm an open and admitted libertarian, but some of it's just you don't do things like everybody else. And that's going to come with a set, set of, um, of, of issues. I think the theme that we, you see a lot, at least with your career so far, is that you, you, you do see problems, but you don't just want to whinge about it. That you actually want to take action steps with what you can to see if you can make a difference. Uh, which, by the way, there, aren't, there, are, there are libertarians definitely that are that way, but uh, there's a, a ton of whingers. <laughs> As oh, well. 100%. I'm right there with your brother. Trust me. Like that. And that's, you know, a lot of folks will complain about the problem like this. And that's the easy thing to do. Don't get me wrong. And that's not to say that that part isn't necessary. Of course, you need people that are out there calling it for what it is. But for me, I think even being in a commentary space, I, I, I like where I'm at right now. I'm in a warehouse right now that we're recording this. I'm, at, I'm physically in my warehouse. Uh, because I was just working right before before we did, did 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 this, and I think this is where I belong, creating, and I think that was what God put me on this earth to do, and that what that is to create. Yeah, I can identify problems, I can talk about it, but coming up with some sort of alternative or some sort of solution to those those issues that I may have, I think certainly is what I'm here to do. And uh, you know, big shout out to everybody that has, of course, been very supportive of the different things that I've done. Um, and also credit to the people that, you know, I've surrounded myself with that have allowed me to put uh, like, you know, just aiding in kind of that vision because not everybody gets it. And, uh, you know, like everybody that's part of the Riververse team are people that have been part of this community or part of uh, or they get it. And I, I could imagine trying to explain this to some person that is just completely oblivious uh, to what's going on and trying to explain it mm -hmm. and what I'm trying to do It'd be a very difficult thing. Um, so big shout out to those guys because I couldn't do it without them as well. But absolutely to your point, it, it's all about uh, putting like the for, forth the uh, effort to actually be part of the uh, solution. So let's get into how your ISOM campaign and your comics career uh, here just got started. You you were doing uh, YouTube for a while. That's where I first knew you. I, I would watch your reaction videos, the, the dumbest, latest comics thing coming out of usually Marvel, sometimes DC. Yeah. How did how did you get into YouTube and why do you think you found success there? Man, YouTube is an interesting thing because I got in, um, you know, when it was kind of getting off the ground. Um, I was 16 years old uh, when I first got on YouTube. So doing the math there um i'm 32 now so it's been a long time i've been on this thing but i always treated it like a hub for me right it was more of what was i doing at the time that i uh that piqued my interest right now just do it like maybe people didn't want it to listen didn't want to listen sometimes they did so that's why it ranged from you know doing the boogie videos to doing like uh the vocal covers and stuff that i used to do i think that was a big kind of launching pad for me doing the vocal covers and then that came in like the the political as well as the social commentary and the comic book stuff. 
a lot of it is like to your point, the, the industry just took a hard left for lack of better terms. Uh, and I just happened to, this happened to be something I'm very knowledgeable on. So it was very easy for me to just talk about it, right? I'm already common. That, that's the easy thing to do. I, I know this industry and now it's being infested with something that, uh, you know, I'm not, let's say necessarily fond of, but I started putting those thoughts out there because I thought that I brought something to that table. Um, because I'm obviously not the only, let's say comic book guy or person that talks comic books. But, you know, part of the appeal is that I'm going to give it to you straight. But it's not just about saying something just for the sake of saying something. It's like when it comes from me, you know, it's somebody that's versed in the topic that it is. He's got, if, you, if you disagree, uh, which many people are going to do that. Still, this is something that I know. Right. Like when I would cover the comics, I'm reviewing these comics and doing all that stuff. So it built me that rapport, certainly with that with that audience to be able to talk about that sort of stuff. But treating it like a hub for everything me was um was was a big part of, of I think the success because and it, and it feels good for me it's why I've like been consistent for as long as I've been because it's fun to do it right if I want to talk I could talk about some most random thing it doesn't matter what it is I can just do a video on it because I feel like talking about it I'm going to talk about it if I feel like doing it I'm going to do it uh and I don't feel like restraint uh because that's not how the channel was set up so I got in built that rapport with the audience and this is why we have people from so many different walks of life that are part of this and are seeing even help and uh, you know seeing the success of the riververse or being part of that and being customers a lot of these guys are coming from different different spots some people know me for the vocal covers some people know me for the music being in metalcore being in hardcore music some people know me from the comic book stuff some people know me for being you know libertarian and all that so it's people coming from different different angles uh but ultimately it's about you know just getting out there and doing what I feel like doing and being certainly honest and transparent with my audience. So yeah, your YouTube is, is great. I enjoy it still. You have like uh 500, 2000 subscribers. So pretty good. Um, so how did, how did you get, did you come up with the idea to make your own comic book or cause you know, some people in the comics, like the comic skate community, yeah. your artist on ISOM is uh, the wonderful Gabe LT who used to work for DC. He's an excellent artist, by the way, very talented. Um, what, what was the inspiration for you to pursue this venture and how did, how did it come together? Well, it's funny because I thought that this was going to be something that was kind of going to be a project that I didn't do until I was like, well, into my forties, uh, fifties perhaps, uh, because I didn't think that I was going to have the money or, you know, something like that. It'd be something that I can do just to kind of, you know, do and wind down or whatever at that stage of my life. But everything accelerated with the success that we had saw over the last over half decade. You know what I mean? Really, it, since probably 2015, just the rise of, of just everything it is that I've done. And so what it did was it it allowed me to have a pool of kind of, of, of resources, whether it be backwards album or whatever, my speaking engagements, no matter what it was, whatever I was getting money from, YouTube for that matter. Uh, and I saved, I saved, I saved. And you know, this problem with comics just got progressively worse. It just kept getting bad. So I'm like, okay, I could go now, right? It's a perfect time, right? It's ripe. Everybody like, still likes comics, uh, you know, even with comic book media, it's still at its apex. I don't want to say it's at its apex, but you know, people are at least wanting to be in the comic book stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Despite it being maybe going in a different direction, even with the comic book film. So I figured there's no need to wait. Let's just give it a shot. I got the I got the money and it was risky, right? I got, you know, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to just make this happen, like to just get everything, the foundational work to make something happen from paying my artists to the, 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 the business, everything. And I took a risk, but it was a risk I was willing to take because I had the pool of resources to do it. So I did it. And the audience responded in a way that I'm not going to sit up here and lie to you. I didn't think it was going to do that. Like 3.7. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. That was not on the agenda right there. That, I'm not going to I'd be fronting if I was like, oh, yeah, I thought we would know. I didn't think we were going to do anything near that, but we did. Uh, so it really reassured myself, the audience, everybody that this is what people want. People want something. It's not that comics is a dead kind of medium or anything. No, it's like people just want something that is maybe alternative to what they have been getting, but it's still something that both new folk and people that have been into comic books would are willing to get in if you present it and package it in a way that they they can digest it. And that's all that we did 
with the Riververse. You mentioned Gabe, uh, you know, Cliff and all the people that are part of this project. These are, these are industry veterans. I surrounded myself with people that knew what they were doing. And this is why, you know, people, uh, so many folks, as we got closer to it, would ask me like, hey, you, know, you got to be getting nervous, right? Because what if it doesn't live up to the hype? I never worried about that. You know why? Hmm. Because I, I, I surrounded myself with people that would have told me if it was trash. Like, you know, Gabe El Taib comes from D.C., right? Cliff comes from D.C., done Marvel stuff. Gabe's done Marvel stuff. Like, so these are guys that are part of these projects, that are part of this project, that know the business, okay? I know the business. They know the business. And me being a customer for as long as I – this isn't my first writing engagement, but I've been a, a customer for as long as I've been. I know what the audience wants. Like, it, it, it's it's very identifiable. So – for me, just like we're backwards, when we well packaged everything, we had all those music videos, everything like we, I, I don't do something and half tell it. I'm not built like that. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do, do it all the way and I'm going to do it right. And uh, I, I think that the audience responded to exactly that. We were transparent the way we kind of uh, did the, took the, let's say the, the vision of, of what maybe a crowdfund would do. Uh, and, you know, just kind of mixed that in our kind of own, thing with that doing it on our website and all that and the audience simply said this is what we want and now that it's in the hands of you know people you know it's been the vast majority of it has been positive reviews and everybody's waiting for ourselves too everybody's waiting for what's next to come and that's what it's about that's what it's about right there it sounds like there was a lot of behind the scenes work and there was a lot of preparatory work to even before the announcement of the campaign i think something i've seen a lot from your critics is that they kind of feel like this is a flash of the pan or you just got really lucky. But from what you're telling me, there actually was a whole lot of investment, of course, money, which is not easy to get for comics. Yeah. Uh, and two, you you knew the right people. You know how to put together the resources. Again, not not easy, not something just anyone can do. So it, 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 that is interesting to me. I'm, I'm glad I got to hear that. So this summer, your, your uh, program launched and you kickstart, you raised... 3.7 million, I think, was what it said in July. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of mm -hmm. money. <laughs> That's a lot it of money. It, it's a lot of money, and I wasn't expecting it. Um, but it's a beautiful thing because it put me in a position to be able to, uh, like right now, I got all my, all my folks in there uh, doing work and, uh, you know, be able to give people solid paying jobs. All the folks that are hired uh, is, it, it, to me, is it's a great feeling to be able to be able to do that and give these people these jobs. Uh, and for me, look, like you said, I know there's going to be critics that say exactly that. And that is that they think that a lot of it's, a lot of it's envy because a lot of these people, especially in the industry, think that so, some people are more deserving of that. Right. So it's like, yeah, why, definitely. why, why aren't, why isn't this artist or this writer or this, this person getting the following or rather getting the enthusiasm that he has. Right. So they have to try to find ways to delegitimize it because they can't just believe like, well, it's an honest thing it's just people people were interested in and and to your point yeah the, i i worked extremely hard um before i'd ever announced it which is why we were able to get it out as fast and quick as we did because of all the work that they did before i ever saw a dime from the customer like i spent again hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that to make that happen but it's logistics as well a lot of people don't understand with us being our own distributor like as well, like that's a that's an entirely different industry. Like that's not just comics, right? It's yep. you have the art part of it and all, and doing all that packaging and getting it printed, but to get it distributed, that's an industry on all on, by itself and on on its own. So we're kind of two companies per se that do that and put that in perspective and giving the audience what you know some perspective on that. When you think of Marvel, you think of DC. They don't do that. Um, for you guys that don't know, a lot of them. I know there was this recent with this like kind of. Penguin at a uh, random house or whatever uh, it is. And I know they moved away from Diamond, but for, for a very long time, uh, Diamond had a stranglehold on the entire distribution industry. Still, they kind of do. Um, they still have exclusive deals with, uh, I believe, Boom Image as well. So all the major people look at them as indies. I don't really look at them like that because they circle the same cycle kind of through the same talent and have kind of the same similar structure as Marvel and DC does. Uh, but for the most part, they've never they've not distributed their own thing. So we do that ourselves. Right. So that and that's a that's a learning experience for me. That's a, that's an entirely different animal. But it's just stuff that we had to uh, kind of figure out how exactly we were going to do that before I ever asked for a dime from the audience. So there's a lot of work that got put into this sleepless nights. 
and it didn't it, it might seem that way because to the definitely to the critic like they they only see that part of it um they don't see everything else and definitely if they've never experienced it's not like they know right this is mm. why we try to be transparent because i think it benefits well, that's an also insight for the audience because some of the stuff they just simply don't know. They don't know that this is how the industry works or how, uh, oh, let's say, unorthodox maybe this is. So it's been a lot of work getting put into this, and I'm glad that the audience responded uh, to it. But it's not like I, we joke around, but it's the truth about like I'm not taking the money and like getting a Lamborghini or something like that. Like the money's getting reinvested to more books, uh, bigger ware- warehouse space, uh, new headquarters. Uh, you know, more talent, like more employees, like that's where the money uh, is going, because this isn't something that I'm just half telling. I'm doing this for real. And um, I'm hoping to leave a mark uh, on this industry. Yeah. And I only bring up, uh, you know, some people don't want to talk about uh, the money thing and I can understand it. But you kind of to put in perspective, the comics industry, I'm not sure if all the profit that DC and Marvel combined they pull out a year is even above a million. I know that they sell backpacks and backpacks is above a million. I know that's often more than their entire comics division. It's that, it's that's weak. That's why that $3 million number is so uh, impressive. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like they're not seeing that profit. They're not largely seeing that profit. Even major indies aren't largely seeing that. I think that's what got a lot of folks irate uh, about it, that we're the critics. And I would encourage them as well as anybody for that matter, to look at it from the perspective of a oh, well, with that success means better paying jobs, means better paying uh not just opportunities for other artists, right? And as well and other writers and and everything uh that like because I think when I look at the industry, a lot of it didn't make sense. When I was that's how I do everything. I look at the industry and say, Hey, all right, well, how's everybody else doing it? Why are they doing it that way? And if I can't justify doing it that way, I simply won't. So even with mm-hmm. the distribution, people are like, well, why don't you go through where's Diamond? Why don't you use Diamond? Well, why? Well, I don't need the comic book shops to necessarily sell it, though comic book shops did purchase ice on from us. But I don't need Diamond to put it in a, let's say, a one of their previews to sell it to a retailer. I don't need to do that. I go directly to the customer. So why would I have, let's say, a middleman taking money off the top if I don't have to do that? You know what yeah. I mean? So. I would encourage people to look into that. And even if you are aspiring to look at that and say, hmm, maybe there's something that I could take and make it more individual to me. And this is what we talk about, like with the decentralization of, of certainly the industry. Yeah, no, it's smart. And the distribution problem is that that was like the fa- one of the big fatal mistakes that brought the industry so low. So you, so you got your company going um, with the announcement, of the Kickstarter, uh, you hit your, a lot of your hopes there. You, you purchased a warehouse. You uh, were able to hire more of your staff, uh, especially some of the people already working with you. Um, it looks pretty, pretty rosy, but then PayPal comes in and decides to play games with uh, your money. What was going on there? That was the most bizarre story out of this, definitely when you consider the conclusion of it. So what happened was PayPal put a hold like we had that initial burst um of of money obviously that came in was that july the 11th when we announced the actual campaign so we got this massive influx and i was actually skeptical to use paypal but the reason why we used it was because mainly for our international customers uh a lot of them prefer that as a payment deal so i was like all right whatever we're gonna do it so we get up to uh eat a lot of people don't know that but we got the hold put on uh like right before a billion dollars or something like that it was something comp i can't remember exactly the line but they just kept res- kept keeping the money like we never was were able to a lot of folks were like why would you let it get that high like we never had access to that money at no point in time they saw the initial hit and they initially put like a hold on it or whatever they called it now for me i get it even though my company didn't start on july the 11th uh, it had actually been operating before then. Yet, if they're going to see that all that money come in, they're like, oh, they want to make sure nothing funky's going on. Okay, fine. But everything that they asked me to provide to ensure that this was a legit thing, we gave them. They knew what, I mean, receipts on down from who I got the, I sent them everything from uh, from even where I got the, the damn comics printed. They got all of that. They got every receipt that they would have ever needed to prove that this is legit. And for whatever reason, they decided once it like, and that was the, you know, that 1.2 marker. Obviously, we cut off uh PayPal altogether. And that was kind of it was like one point, almost 1.3 million. And they held that. 
And it's, it went from just a standard hold to a what they call a reserve. And that reserve was basically them saying that they are going to hold the money for 60 days. Right. And I can't touch. We can't do anything with it. And they say it's because they want to ensure that there's no chargebacks and all that. And they were holding 100 percent of the funds, not half of it. 100 percent of it was being in the put in the reserve. And they said that on the 61st day, they were going to give us the money back uh, and it was going to be on a rolling period. So basically on the 61st day, everything that we got from July 11th, as we understood it, uh, we would get the money on. We would get that money on 100 percent of it. That was exactly the transaction number that they, they said 100 percent of it. We were going to end up getting it. So cool. They got they, they uh, 60, uh, it was supposed to be 61 days, 62nd day. You can imagine July 12th. That's when we get that money. So it was a rolling period. Yeah. yeah. So over 61 days come, we still can't access. We've got nothing. They try to renew it, <laughs> the reserve, for another 90 days this time. So now that for the same reason, there's a phantom. There, and by, by when I say same reason, there is no reason. They couldn't give us a legitimate reason. So at that point, I was like, you know, I obviously – our lawyers were working on this like before uh, we kind of weighed the pros and cons of going after them. And then we were like, all right, well, if we wait this out, we'll see. But it's because it, this could get a, a rather expensive. But we gave them a chance. And that's when it was like, all right, well, at this point, let's 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 kick it up a notch. So between my lawyers and letters being, uh, uh, you know, created as well as uh, myself going after them and doing it publicly, they stealth edited it. And what they did was, OK, they said, like, all right, well, we'll get 50 percent. Basically, uh, we'll just give them that and then I'm gonna shut them up. But the rest is still going to be on reserve. I said, no, 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 no. Y'all <laughs> said by your own metrics, you shouldn't have ever had it on a reserve. I didn't fraud anybody or anything like that. But y'all said by your own uh, uh, in your own message center, you told me that we were going to get 100 percent of the transactions starting on the 61st day. I didn't ask for half of it and then get another half 90 days after no, I want the whole thing. And so we we went back at them, and then they still fed it again. We never got an update as to why, by the way. Never, never got an update. They just released the money, and we took it out immediately, and the, we were done, obviously, with PayPal. So that lets you know how grimy they are. Uh, it, it, I hate that it had to go to threatening, you know, illegal stuff and all that, uh, going that route. But the fact that they didn't even want to admit fault there, you know what I mean? Like they're like, oh, we're just gonna stealth edit it. Oh, we know he's coming from. Let's just give him the money. And that, that we'll try to shut him up. It just really goes to show that you gotta watch kind of who you're doing business with, and that's certainly another learning experience for me. I've told my audience, I'm sorry. I know some of y'all like to use PayPal. Definitely your international stuff. No, no more. Uh, it's frustrating. So you know, at the time, some people were saying, well, maybe uh, July didn't understand the PayPal, and that PayPal wouldn't release the funds until they had. You, you had product to give, but then it seems like even when you were obeying what they asked for, they found a new pretense. And really that seems cool. why I think, I think that's really what happens, especially pay, not just PayPal, a lot of those uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies, a lot of those uh, digital financing companies, they do this, they're like, they, there are reasons they give you, right? That the, in, but, but the actual reason is something else. Who knows? Maybe there's someone at PayPal that just is like, I really hate that one guy. He made that one video I didn't like. Now I'm going to make his life. I'm just gonna ruin him. Uh, so it is. It yeah, is it crazy. Can and it's like 100%, that. Kind of, like that. That is. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's just like that kind of thing. It, it can really stop a lot of things. One of, one, of course, it's dirty. And two, it can it can just destroy so much. And there's not and a this, lot of recourse you have to stop to your it. Point. Bingo. And to your point. To your point, which is so important. Like, imagine if all we used was paypal let's say exclusively paypal was the only processor that we used we would not have had money to do a lot of things right and i could imagine a company now thankfully um you know we obviously were getting funds from people before pre-orders for before but obviously we had to pull the money that that i just had regardless but not all people have that hundreds of thousands of dollars saved up imagine if it's just it's a basic mom and pop shop owner and they were launching something and maybe they saw some success and then PayPal just said no. And let's say the entire thing was processed through PayPal just because of like kind of the ease of access 
uh, deal. They would have never gotten access to that funds. You can see how that can derail in a business. Like that can completely, like literally destroy a, a, a business. And uh, to be fair, I think that's what so many people, I don't know if the folks at PayPal wanted that, no, I wouldn't put it past them, but that's what a lot of folks wanted, which is why it was so easy to rally behind. Hey, they took his money. I hope they take more of it. I had one guy say, I'm not going to suddenly say his name, but another content creator said they hope he, he hoped they, they take my house too. Uh, is what they said. Uh, <laughs> it's vicious. Like, wow. Yeah, exactly. These guys, uh, these guys really don't like me. I mean, God forbid, I, the guy just starts a comic book company. Uh, but seriously, like, and that's the problem that I had with it is that I'm looking at it from, from, from that perspective. Like just imagine how that could have ruined my business. Like just cause I didn't mm -hmm. have just for basic like shipping, like, you know what I mean? Like the money to, I don't have all of that would have the money that people paid to have it shipped would have been going through PayPal and we wouldn't have had access to it. So we would have been eating the cost on all the shipping. Uh, so just, to, just imagine how that could derail a business. But to your point, yeah, they just make up reasons. Um, you know, vague terms of service and all that stuff that they can try to apply kind of willy nilly. Um, and yeah, if you don't go at them like kind of aggressively, definitely with uh, with legal pursuit, like unfortunately, there's not much you can do to combat them if they decide to take you down. Yeah, no, and I am glad it turned out the way it did. I'm glad it worked out in the end. You guys were able, your lawyers worked their magic, and it, for it, it, it stuck somehow. They must be really good at their job because they actually. Oh did, man, they they are the best. They made a change. Business. Shout out to them. Okay, so Isom is now come out the first issue. Uh, people can order it now. I've read it. It's a decent book. I really like the art. I think the art is very strong. I think for someone that this is really their first comic writing, I think it's all right. I've I've read much worse. Um. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an interesting book i think people if they're interested in comics they might like it what do you so one i'd kind of like to ask a little bit about what your influence there because religion seems to be an influence with uh your your main character there and that's a little different um especially christian characters the of course the mate the the big two they do not like to get anywhere near that kind of thing um, and then I also like to think you know what's the reaction you've gotten from people why do you think it, it's being received so well yeah, I mean, for me, like it was um, I wanted to do something that was on on orthodox, but also very down to earth. That was the purpose from everything from ISOMs. The actual suit design was by design. It was meant to do that and look like that and give kind of that. That uh, uh, where pe look that familiarity is the term that I'm looking for, for people that are into the books, while also having a look that someone that maybe not that they may be new to it can see it and be like hmm that looks intriguing what is this about and it was a very difficult thing to do because not only are you launching ison right you are launching a universe right this is not just i have to try to set the scene for getting people enthusiastic not just about this one character but this entire world how do i get people invested in that and that was what we were trying to accomplish and i said this long before the book had even come out. I'm not interested right now into giving people some world breaking, earth shattering, going over over the top, intricate, the worlds are at stake and on the line type of story, because that's something that needs to be built um, upon. Like that's that's not what it is. We're, this is the long game that we're certainly planning uh, here. So for me, it was like, OK, I want to take something that's a little unorthodox while giving people the familiarity and also launching my own like kind of universe. And that was extremely difficult, but I think we put it off perfectly. I spent like the better part of a year just world building, like writing in my universe Bible, who this character is, who these other characters are and their origins, all of that. Obviously not all of that got announced and, and addressed in the car in the cards or the concept part of the book itself. But it's still something that I that I that I did because I wanted to do this certainly the right way. So really, my aspiration there was just okay. What made let's say a Marvel or DC intriguing to me wasn't just one character. Some people read books for stuff like that, one-offs. Bam, I like it. Start well, begin and finish, whatever. That's why. I, that's not me. I got into books like that because, or what kept me around to be more accurate, was the fact that. This character existed in this vast universe. And it wasn't even about them linking up with each other. It was the fact that, well, if something crazy happened, though they've kind of moved away from this, 
but that impacts the world at large and and the experience of the other character right new york city how it still has all that crime who knows they got 50 heroes there uh if you read marvel right but you know they may link up with each other something happens and back you know you can read new mutants x-men or whatever and you they'll tell you hey if you want to know why it's doing something or why why the weather is the way this is during this time of the year then you need to read this other book i thought that was the coolest thing in the world so uh, that was really the biggest the, the big inspiration was the world building aspect though it's not exclusive to the comics that's what i found most intriguing so to do something on orthodox there's not many heroes from texas right there's not many heroes from the south altogether i mean again if you if you look at definitely with like marvel like seems seems like the east coast is just where everybody is. you got the west coast too but where's the south at where's that coming to play it's almost non-existent i was like all right let's give it a shot uh stan lee tend tend to write characters that were from new york because that's where he was from right so mm -hmm. that was easy for me i'm from texas so i was like i know i know texas i've been i've lived north texas south texas i know it like the back of my hand Let's do something kind of based upon that. So that was a big thing. And I wanted to do something that wasn't like cliche, something that wasn't like uh, very predictable in terms of this this character, uh, definitely with Isom. So a lot of the influence was, uh, 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 again, the world building aspect that I got from things from other comic books I read, but also just trying to do something that was just a little bit against the grain. So though it has that level of familiarity, people would still read it and feel like, well, this is something knew that I can kind of uh, get in. And to your last point about that reception, it's been great because of exactly that. Like I, I said I was going to do something and I did it. it. It was exactly that. It wasn't any shenanigans here. I, when I said this was the goal here, I was public about it. We have a public code of ethics. You read the book, you see the code of ethics there. So people know exactly what this company is about. And they know exactly what I'm about uh, as far as what we're attempting to do here. And I think the fact that people just got something, it wasn't beating, uh, beating people over the head, like people, some, you know, you, you mentioned this whole like Christianity thing, like that's not even addressed in the first book or, in, or, or anything uh, to that matter, because like for me, it's about the character building and it doesn't matter what walk of life uh, you're from, where you're, where you're at, like um, what kind of it, what your ethnic background is, these concepts that we, that we initially a go through with ISOM. I mean, starting with the family aspect of it, it's something that some folks are gonna find some uh, intrigue and some relatability uh, with. So I think that's just, it, it's not, it wasn't about trying to reinvent the wheel right there. It was more about, hey, I wanna do something that I know works. I know what I certainly wanted as a customer. Let me just provide it. None, no shenanigans, no beating my audience over the head with all this bull crap, just give it to them straight. And they responded and that's just simply what it is they wanted. So, yeah, that, that's a good point. So a big feature of your website in the marketing was you talked about your code of ethics, how you would try to treat the characters. You said things like we would try to keep it uh, a clean continuity, a uh, reliable one, that we would try to stay away from reboots. Um, I don't think it's in the code of ethics, but, you know, kind of stuff like we would try not to do any woke nonsense. Uh, I know some people who are critics feel like, you know, you're in some ways it feels like you're almost putting the how do they put that the plow before the horse like you have all these ideas yeah. you want this expanded yeah. universe and you're just at the start of your comics I, I i might push back a little bit though because i would like to know do you think the the stuff like you have done like you're reassuring customers is that does that help you sell comics is that is that necessary because of the state of comics and people are just so burnt out or how did why did you guys come to that decision and what have you heard from people when they when they I, read things like that? I, I, I think this is the 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 to me the future of entertainment, right? Not ISOM or Ripperverse, the the decentralization of it all, right? And that is that you have somebody that did it his way. It may not be how everybody else is doing it, but it's his way, and this is what it is. And instead of being some faceless mega corporation who really just moves with the tide anyway. And if they think that this is in or whatever blue haired weirdo that they hired right out of college, that told them this is what the market wanted, though they may be disastrously wrong. Uh, that's what they told them. And that's where they sway. This is different, right? You, you can connect, you know, immediately because of the code of ethics, you know exactly where it is that they stand. And that more than I, I I'm not even going to say it like it hurt that more than helped this company. That's one of the biggest things, one of the 
a leading things that people mentioned that have that got into it. Like I know a lot of folks under this myth uh, that, well, only people that have bought it or people that followed me, that couldn't be anything further from the truth because there were people that in introduced and sometimes it was by, you know, the, the people that hate me did themselves in because all that talk that they were doing about it, got it in the eyes of someone else. And they were like, what is this all about? And then they looked into it and they bought it. Right. So, a lot of that and leading with that sort of stuff and giving it to the audience straight is, I think, what you're going to have to do if you want to see success. I think this whole faceless megacorp uh, or, or, or like, you know, uh, approach that we've been accustomed to is going to work for those that have been doing it and have obviously have been a fabric, let's say, of American culture because they've been around for so long. But if you are a person, group of people, that are trying to do something new, you can't get away with it anymore. Like people want to know who they're buying their products from. Definitely in this day and age where people are, you know, you got folks seeming to despise their own customers or at least a set, I don't want to say all their customers, but let's say a, a sector of them that may think like maybe they vote in a different way or whatever the reason is. That's, that's, that might do yourself in, right? So now mm -hmm. people just want to know exactly what they're getting themselves into. And it's not going to be for everybody, but there's no sense of pretending that you are for everybody. Just give it to them straight. And if they want in, they'll get in on it. And that's what we did. That's, that's, it was simple as that. And that's going to be something that we keep a part of our project forever. Uh, and that is that leading with the code of ethics. Um, it's funny, like, you, you know, people that mentioned the whole, uh, you know, even like the wokeness or lack thereof, like we didn't say anything about wokeness in our code of ethics. That's yeah. not to say that obviously I would present myself as that or do that and bait and switch my audience. No, what I'm saying is, is that what we are about is in that code of ethics. What we are leading with is in that code of ethics. You see our trailers, you see uh, what it is, the, the material that we put out there. That's what it's about. It's about giving customers what it is that they want and, and and listening to their feedback and listening to what it is that they are into and what they're not into and making adjustments based um, upon that while maintaining some semblance of creative freedom. And it just happened to work out. For so I that's interesting. I think you're probably right about where, where what people want and where the where not just nerd culture but all kinds of things people just i think people are so burned out by bad tactics and bad faith uh business that they that they need reassurances like that but um let's talk a little bit so isom uh what do you guys have coming up next for your characters i know you have partnered with uh some of the people already mentioned that they want to build comics in your universe what do uh, people who read Isom or want to read Isom, what are, should they expect next in the Ripiverse? Well, we have right now, for example, we have Isom 2. We're about 50 pages already in of that, of uh, pencil and ink, about 40 or so pages in on uh, of colors. So that's a, that's coming along. Uh, but we also have a couple of more books that have, the scripts have been wrote. wrote. Um, one is another book that uh, we'll announce soon enough that isn't ISOM 2 that is already having pencil and ink applied to it. Uh, so we're hitting the ground running. Like I know people are like, oh, is the next one gonna come out two years or not? Like we're already rocking and rolling. And as we get more settled and as we get more caught up, right? Like right now I'm working out of the warehouse. Ideally, that's not what I have to do. Um, ideally, I won't be doing that. Ideally, uh, just be in the more so creative space, but this is what we have to do now. So we build up to the point to where we catch up to where we're, we're at uh, um, as a company. There's going to be even more material. So people should just expect more books and, and, and just keeping up with, with us through the medium that they already got the project from. And that was uh, the website. Like we are using that as a true measure metric rather of what the audience wants. People have known they got emails and stuff. We were talking about polls. We're doing all this stuff because we really want to know what people want. I, I do music, so I know better than anybody. Sometimes you put something out and you think that this is what people want. You can put out an album and you think this song is going to be what everybody loves and it might happen to be something that some people find just okay. And then there's this song that you thought you kind of just threw in was the last one to get on the album and that turns out to be a fan favorite. <laughs> Uh, yeah. it, it works out like that. And you have to be uh, open, be it to the critical aspect of it or whatever it is to understand 
that engaging your audience. So we're, we're keeping tabs on that. There may be background characters or whoever it is that character people are like, I want to know more about that person. And, um, you know, we kind of pivot on plan sometimes. So it's about getting that audience feedback and making a uh, material that's based upon that. Sounds smart. Uh, right now, your focus is mostly on physical comics. Are you interested in um, doing digital comics or releasing ISOM to digital at some point? I mean, if that is going to happen, it's going to be down the line. So to be completely honest, initially, no, that's not the plan. Um, the plan is to keep doing what it is that we're doing right, right now uh, and putting out physical comics, physical media, uh, um, physical like you know material people that's tangible, people can hold. Uh, merchandise items, stuff like that is the focus. Digital, yeah, there's the piracy element that you have to worry about. But it's also just, I, I don't really, to me, when I think comics, I still think it's a physical medium. I still think it's one of those mediums that will be led by exactly that. And I'm, I'm not, not to say that some people don't prefer to read digital, but I think for us and our company, it just makes the most sense to just continue to really hammer the point home uh, with physical media. And digital comics is in a very weird place right now because everything that happened with um, Amazon, it's sad that it's basically the point now where most of the comics YouTubers I follow, um, you know, like EVS or Richard Meyer, they're like, okay, here's proof I bought this comic, and but it's unreadable on this website, so yeah. still, we're going to we're going to cover it on this pirate site, uh, which is that that's. Ugh, there's just so many things in comics that just it's like it does feel like there's so yep. many things that could be fixed should be fixed and no one does it that seems to be doing it but you you see that open space and you are taking it just does, does all this give you more hope for comics i mean you're you're kind of like me in 2015 2016 it felt like man we are just spiraling down the toilet uh i mean comics are going to disappear people are going to forget this was even a medium Did, are you more hopeful about comics you know where the industry might go or the medium <sighs> Not for the mainstream. Uh, I, I just I hate to be that way for the mainstream, but no, definitely the big two. When I say mainstream, uh, I know some, some people think I'm exclusively talking Marvel, but like I said, Image, Boom, a lot of those guys cycle the same talent. IDW, like it's the same, and it's the, or it's the same kind of economic uh, approach or even philosophical or whatever you want to call it. Just approaches are largely the same, maybe done on a slightly smaller scale. I don't... For those guys, I don't think it's going to be it's going to be a rough. Let me say that a lot of these comics, you know, a lot of co uh, creatives are flat out admitting how much in the red they are. You know what I mean? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's just it's the, the a lot of people are not into it. Let's just be honest. That's not to say people aren't into books. We see manga in the West continues to grow. But for American comic books, I think for a lot of guys that are doing their own thing, we'll see success. It's not just a me thing. You mentioned, you know, EVS and you mentioned other comics gay guys that have done successful projects, but there's people inside of that and outside of that that are doing kind of their own thing, their own way, and they're seeing success. And I just think that's the way of the future. And that's going to look different, right? That's going to look weird, actually, to be completely honest. Uh, but I'm okay with it. I'm okay with a decentralized uh, kind of ec economic kind of approach with, with comic books that who knows who the top dog is? I don't particularly care. Uh, some people want me to like uh, think, that, oh, well, he's the new big guy and bad guy. In town. I don't give a crap about the titles and all. Y'all can have that. I don't care. I just want to make make uh, books and make money off the book. That's it. That's all I'm interested in. Whether I'm first place in the middle, or I don't give a crap about any of that. Uh, but it's that, I think that's the way of the future. And because of that, you're going to have people going uh, directly to – uh, the, the people it is that they want or groups of people that they want the books from and with the like people selling directly to their customers, what are the retailers falling at? Like, it's a lot of things that are going to be. Let me say this. The status quo was being or is being protected for a reason, because what's going to happen on the other side of it is uncertainty. And some people don't like that. Uh, people have been doing it one way. It's been the same way for, for a while now. There hasn't been much of a shakeup. So if it goes in the way that I think it's going to go with the decentralization, who knows what this is going to look like. And there's going to be some people that may fall in and out. And I welcome that. Even if it was me, even if it's me that, that somehow doesn't make it on the other side, I'm I'm OK with that because I think ultimately the customers benefit the most if, if that's the approach. Awesome. Well, I, I totally agree. 
Well, hey, Eric, thank you so much for doing this. Um, any comics you're reading right now or things that you're following? Are you playing any games lately or anything like that? Oh, you seem man, to be pretty like, busy. Man, yeah, it, it's funny, man. Like, I don't, I feel like I don't have time to do anything anymore other than work. Um, it's, you know, people think, oh, yeah, you got a million dollars. What are you doing? Kick back in the pool side, like, with his money. <laughs> like, nah, bro, like, I'm working. I'm, I'm right now in the, in the warehouse doing my thing. So I haven't even been keeping up with that. A lot of my, like definitely information that I get on what's going on uh, in in like even the comic book industry. I'm looking at other content creators that keep their keep their pulse on the industry. And uh, really, that's it. But as far as me, like even gaming, I don't get much time to play a lot of that, uh, certainly as much as I had uh, been in the past. So it, it's unfortunate. But this is kind of what it is uh, with what it is that I am doing. You know what I mean? It's to work, work. Work, work, work. Uh, man, it's a good <laughs> position to be to be in. Honestly, I love what I do. I, I'm a worker. I ain't worked this hard in my life, um, but I love it. I absolutely love it. Excellent. Well, where? I mean, obviously, we've already mentioned it, but in your words, where can people find you and your work? Ripperverse.com. Of course, you can get all the books. You can keep up with us uh, on Ripperverse.com. My my YouTube page, Young Ripper Five Nine. Of course, is where I individually do my, my stuff. I'll be get back to streaming. And doing all that cool stuff soon enough, but we got a lot of work that we have to do before we get uh, certainly to that point. But Riververse.com is certainly where you want to be if you want to keep up. Cool. Well, friends, thank you so much for listening to the program today. It was wonderful to have Eric on. I learned a lot. Enjoyed this conversation. Um, be sure to check his stuff at Riververse. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. I'm excited to see where this uh, story takes us. Well, until next time, friends, keep geeking out. Thank you.